Burns came to Edinburgh with a clear mission to make money, but I think he was looking for something else too. Back in Ayrshire, he'd been infamous, notorious even, but that wasn't enough for him. Burns also wanted to measure himself against the greatest men of his age. Eighteenth-century Edinburgh was a hub of philosophical, medical, legal and journalistic genius. David Hume, Adam Smith, James Hutton, Joseph Black, James Boswell. A seemingly endless list of great men had placed Edinburgh at the very centre of Europe's intellectual life. What's more, a sophisticated literary culture existed here and Burns arrived from Ayrshire determined to chance his hand and find his place in it. Burns hit the ground running in Edinburgh. He quickly came into contact with the publisher William Creech, whose offices were in this very close. The idea was that he would raise the subscribers for this new edition, so Burns put his mind to that and got busy. But would the inhabitants of this most refined of cities really want to subscribe to an expensive book containing rustic poems such as To a Mouse, which said that man was no more significant than the smallest creature? It was down to Burns himself to drum up interest in the book, and just a few days after he arrived in Edinburgh, he got a great helping hand with the review of a lifetime from Henry Mackenzie, Edinburgh's leading critic. It's something that I've long heard of, but never seen. Andrew, well, nice to see you again. It's great to see you. Here at the National Library of Scotland, they keep a copy of that very publication. And what you're coming to see is the lounger. Right, in you come. Thank you. Here we are, this is the famous review. And it's most famous of all, I think, for the, the wonderful passage on the final page, where he says, you will perceive with what uncommon penetration and sagacity this heaven-taught ploughman from his humble and unlettered station has looked upon men and manners. And Burns, of course, rose to it splendidly. In a way, this was, this was good fodder for him because he liked to go around as the heaven-taught ploughman. He wore nothing but boots mm -hmm. in Edinburgh, which most people didn't do. They wore silk stockings, but he wore boots as if he'd come from the field. He wore but, buckskins on great occasions. And of course, that, that phrase, heaven taught plowman, yeah, stuck. That's right. And Mackenzie was solely responsible for the, in a way, the image. Presumably, the lounger had no massive circulation. How important, Ian, would a review like this have been in the Edinburgh of the day? I think it would have been very important because all the men of the Edinburgh establishment and their ladies would have read this periodical. This is the Advocates Library copy. We can speculate with certainty that this very copy was read by many of the leaders of the Scottish Enlightenment, certainly those of them who were members of the Faculty of Advocates. And on one of these pages, there's a very gratifying claret stain, <laughs> which shows that it's been read with enjoyment. Perhaps by Burns himself. Possibly by Burns. In the pages of The Lounger, Burns read the review that would change his life. God, Burns must have had a few pints in celebration when he got this. I know not if I shall be accused of such enthusiasm and partiality when I introduce to the notice of my readers a poet of our own country with whose writings I have lately become acquainted. But if I am not greatly deceived, I think I may safely pronounce him a genius of no ordinary rank. And this must have blown Burns away. There's something also quite patronising about his tone throughout the review. He keeps referring to his lowly station and a man with his disadvantages and so on. I mean, if you were to put that kind of stuff into the review of an author's work nowadays, it would be considered completely horrendous and unacceptable. You know, the sense that, well, we must make allowances for this guy. You know, he's been working in the fields and he's untutored. Um, and there it is. Heaven top plowman gives a notion of a guy who was just, you know, doused by the muse one day out in the fields, who all came to him from the sky. 
Well, of course, Burns had a pretty good classical education, and yet he accepted this label. He realised at any rate that it was a way of identifying himself. It was the great point of difference. Burns wasn't just a genius, he was a genius who came from a farm. The review in the lounger catapulted Burns into Edinburgh's high society. And all at once, Burns had the fame he'd craved. I have been introduced to a good many of the noblesse. I have warm and wise friends among the literati. I was, sir, when I was first honoured with your notice, too obscure. Now I tremble lest I should be ruined by being dragged too suddenly into the glare of polite and learned observation. Burns shone in the limelight, with his farmer's boots and a formidable eloquence honed in his Ayrshire debating club, he dazzled all he met here, performing his poems at soirees and private gatherings across the city, holding forth on the great topics of the day. The closest thing to it for a writer today is the Edinburgh International Book Festival. There is no poet in any country, in any language, where writers turn into performers and get the chance to explain their work and their influences. With brilliance and excellence in the way that Robert Burns does, he is the world's best poet. He would have loved it up here. Oh, would some power, the gift he gave us, to see ourselves as others see us, it would free money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs and gait and dress would leave us, and the end devotion. Burns was a genius, a legend, so any too strong association of his experience with mine would just be comical. This notion that the Ireland that my people... But I think this city's ongoing fascination for the business of literature is something he would recognise. Writers today have got it much easier than Burns ever had. When he performed in small private gatherings, he was hoping to raise subscribers to his edition, and there would be no print run without them. With every invitation he accepted, every supper party he joined, he was creating demand for his new book. Even if that meant playing the part of the heaven top ploughman. That I have some merit, I do not deny. But I see with frequent ringings of heart that the novelty of my character and the honest national prejudice of my countrymen have borne me to a height altogether untenable to my abilities. I am in a fair way of becoming as eminent as Thomas a Kempis or John Bunyan, and you may expect henceforth to see my birthday inserted among the wonderful events in the poor Robin's Almanac. In all probability, I shall soon be the tenth worthy and the eighth wise man of the world. Edinburgh was a kind of mirage for Burns, something that he knew wouldn't last. You get a deeper sense of that here in Canongate Churchyard. I suppose this might be the ultimate tribute from one poet to another. No sculptured marble here nor pompous lay, no storied urn nor animated bust. This simple stone directs pale Scotia's way to pour her sorrows for the poet's dust. This monument was raised by Robert Burns to honour fellow poet Robert Ferguson, who had died penniless and insane only a few years before Burns arrived here. Robert Ferguson was a huge inspiration to Burns. He wrote in Scots too. He had been rejected by the same Edinburgh that now embraced Burns. And before Burns came along, Ferguson's grave had been unmarked. I think Burns saw Ferguson as a sort of warning about what could happen to poets in Scotland. Ferguson's sad death in dire poverty was something Burns became determined to avoid. Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head for all that? The coward slave, we pass him by, we dare be poor for all that. For all that and all that, our toils obscure for all that, 
the rank is but a guinea stamp, the man's the goad for all that.